very warm welcome to this week's Scene on 7. I'm Steve Brennan. Now then, my guests this week are the District Commissioner for the Scouts, Tony Harris. Also, Michael Piercy discusses the magazine, The Story Seller, and the lovely Sarah Stewart, one of our own presenters. They're all guests in the studio later in the program, and of course, here is the rest of the menu as usual. This week's Scene on 7. Young consumers and how they can be best informed with Tom Magna. Will Kinder gets a dose of aromatherapy and a free massage. We discuss access for the disabled and visually handicapped. Tony O'Rourke has afternoon tea at the Theatre Royal with Jean Boat. And music this week comes from Phantom Blue, rocking it up on Scene on 7. Andre can't be with us this week. He's not very well. Get well soon, Adrian. Uh, sorry, Andre, but he'll be back next week. So I feel it's only my duty to cover the sport, as there's quite a bit of it. As the national football team's proposed match in Berlin on Adolf Hitler's birthday has been postponed, there's little point in going over it. Suffice it to say that I personally haven't met anyone who agrees with the decision to be scared off by a bunch of thugs who may or may not demonstrate Nazi tendencies. Don't they realize the war finished 50 years ago? Well, Paul Gascoigne is sidelined for between 12 and 18 months after a rather silly tackle during a training session with Lazio. Paul apparently has not learned the, les learned the lesson of his Tottenham days when his playing career was threatened by severe cruciate ligament injuries. His leg is now broken in two places and doubts remain over his future. England were victorious over the West Indies for the first time in 59 years, a Barbados-based win thanks to Alex Stewart's innings and some excellent performances all round. And the finalists in this year's FA Cup are Chelsea, as predicted right here. They, they will meet Manchester United. The 14th of May final at Wembley is eagerly awaited by yours truly, of course, and as a, specta a spectator at the semi-final, I can tell you that the fanatical Chelsea support assisted the boys to blue in victory. Now then, thanks very much incidentally to Steve Clark and Jakob Kelberg and to John Spencer and the other players uh, and their wives for a fantastic night out after the game and their hospitality. Chelsea beat Luton Town 2-0 and Manchester United beat Oldham 4-1 in a replay at, Man Road, at Main Road, I beg your pardon. Gavin Peacock scored two goals at Wembley. That was his picture that you just missed, and I, so did I. Uh, so, see you at Wembley. I'm looking forward to the game, and Chelsea are going to beat Manchester United. Now, with his eager eye concentrating on consumer issues for the young, here's Tom Magna. Nowadays, efficiency and friendly advice a no match for knowing more about your rights when the goods or services you've paid for just don't come up to scratch. Knowledge is the quality that's put Isleworth Gumley House Convent School top of the class in this year's Young Consumer of the Year competition. Cherie Williams, you're head of the sixth form and in charge of the school's entry. Third time lucky for Gumley House. What do you think's been the secret this time? I think actually the team that took part this year had took part last year. They were enthusiastic and um, they get on very well together. They are very bright girls as well and we're delighted they won the competition. One of the aims of the uh, competition is to make more people aware of consumer issues. How much have you learnt yourself? Quite a bit actually. Some things like um, my rights as a consumer I didn't realise that if you paid by credit card for HP goods, or you had HP goods, that the credit card company was liable if you defaulted, or if, if the goods were faulty, they had to pay. And um, there, can, there can be all sorts of problems in, 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 in real life. How relevant do you think this competition really is? I think it depends on what stage of your life you're at, actually. For me, it was very relevant because they were asking questions as I'm a homeowner, I have a child, I have a husband, and the things that were relevant to them and to myself, um, things about mortgage, um, about your rights when you buy something, television, television licenses, etc. Um, I wonder if at the moment it would be relevant to the young people who took part, but they might remember it in the future. If the school goes on and wins the London Regional Final and then goes on and wins the National Final, what, what do you think you're going to learn? 
I think that I will learn that it's worthwhile to take part in these kind of competitions and certainly we will take part next year again. upper six team was Kerry Carpenter, Marie O'Sullivan, Arlene Rebellio, and uh, in the front here Zoe Collier and Natalie Borres. Give us an example of the sorts of questions you were asked. Um, there are various different categories. Um, for example they had food and drink and there was various sort of, um, things on food labelling and the laws to do with that. Um, there were questions on various bodies you should go to if you had complaints about different things. And what, what sort of about, for example, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of talk nowadays about the European community. Was that the sort of subject that was covered? Yeah, there was a lot of European community and environmental law related to that, so, yeah. Okay, Zoe, so what is the recipe for success? Um, to get on with the rest of the team and to revise a lot, <laughs> so. Having been through the competition now, what sort of, sort of advice would you give consumers, knowing what you now know? Um, know your rights and stick by them. Don't be sort of cut off when people try and, you know, fob you off with sort of... I don't think you should get aggressive, but you should be mm -hmm. assertive and be persistent until you get where you want. McBain, your principal consumer advisor for the London Borough of Hounslow. What's the aim of this competition? Uh, we feel that the aim of the competition is to try and reach um, people at the youngest possible age to raise awareness of consumer and environmental issues in its widest sense, promote consumer awareness, um, hopefully to equip them to be better consumers as they grow older. The competition's been running now for eight years. You've seen six of those in Hounslow. What longer term effect do you believe it will have? Well, hopefully, I mean, the young pupils that we bring into the competition are going to be the consumers, employees, employers and traders of tomorrow. So we hope in the long term they will have the relevant knowledge to enable them to work out in the uh, dynamic organisation and field that they have. But there's a feeling, really, that, that, that life is getting harder for the consumer, life is getting harder for the businessman, the trader. How readily are they going to remember the lessons they've learned? We hope um, that they will remember them because very often these are very general issues. We provide them with an information pack that um, they can work uh, on and so we hope that yes they will uh, remember a lot of the issues that they pick up in the competition. If the Gumley House team get through the London finals on the 28th of April and the national competition in Brighton in June, they'll have taken the message of consumer awareness further than any other Hounslow school in the history of the competition. Thank you, Tom, and the pupils and staff at Gumley House School. Many thanks also to all of you that have written in with some highly complimentary remarks about the programme. And also about the Moving Magazine service. Thank you very much indeed to Sarah Fielder of Ashford. Sarah, it was nice talking to you on the phone as well. Uh, keep the letters coming in. We'll be very, very delighted to receive them. Now, you may have noticed on our splendid Moving Magazine service that we currently have some extra special offers for WMTV viewers. Free goodies from us to you. So it's up to you. It's obviously well worth keeping in touch with all that's happening on Channel 7. How many of us were Boy Scouts or Girl Guides when we were a little younger? I was a Boy Scout, that is. Well, the Scout movement locally needs help now, and here's the District Commissioner, Tony Harris, to tell us more. Tony, welcome to WMTV. Welcome, thank you. 
Um, um, I know I got the, that bit wrong, didn't I? Because it's no longer, and for a long, long time, hasn't been long, Boy long Scouts. Time. Like nearly 30 years now we haven't been called Boy Scouts. Well, I'm 39 this week, well, so I was, I was only I a Boy you. Scout. I forgive All you. Right. Uh, Tony, you're the District Commissioner uh, right, yes. for the Slough yeah. area, for the, yeah. the Scout movement. What exactly are your responsibilities? My responsibility is the welfare for our 700 members in Slough, and also to ensure that we, um, we plan ahead and develop scouting for the young people that are involved. How long have you been involved in the scout movement in total? That includes in the first bit when you had the short socks and the short trousers. Yeah, I think about 20 years in various roles. Long so time. A long time. And your, your role has, has evolved or do you, do you come in at a junior level and then grow with it or? You, you can come into a junior level, you can come in at uh, any age really, up to 65, and um, the role you take on is the role you're happy with doing. Right. Uh, now the original perception, people's perception of the Boy Scouts was originally, um, let's say, a load of kids sitting around a campfire singing meaningless yeah. lyrics. That's all obviously very, very wrong. Yeah. And today's Scout movement is a very, very different scenario altogether. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, very briefly, uh, we can offer young people adventurous activities, i.e. mountaineering, canoeing, abseiling, caving. We can offer them international scouting where they can go abroad. Uh, we have uh, exchange programs. So the image of us sitting around a campfire singing silly songs, uh, I mean, that. yes, we still do that. But um, the public's perception of us, uh, it may be leans towards that image but nothing is further from the truth yeah you know we're a very active movement not only do we sort of, uh, sort of do our out outdoor activities we're also involved in community in the community helping other people and um, as well as that of course it is is actually radically involved with helping young people grow into decent adults basically yes we're into the, it's, it's, it's personal development of young people giving them an opportunity to take part in activities and programs where in their youth that they can enjoy and undertake and achieve something. Uh, I remember taking the, the, the scout code, you know, everybody used to have to say it, I promise to do this and I promise to do that. Yes. Now, although they're slightly outmoded, the principles are basically the same. Do they still apply? They still apply, yes. Um, we're a movement, we've moved, we move with the times, we listen to what young people want. Um, but. The, the, the promise, if you like, is still there. It's still the basis of our movement. Um, in one area, helping other people, this year, um, the UK Scouts are undertaking a, a project with UNICEF and Ugandan Scouts, whereas we're getting into the Ugandan villages with uh, vaccination programs for the, for the toddlers, because they haven't got any. We, we take for granted that we, we go to the doctors, get a jab for measles, etc., etc., and we're fine. They haven't got that facility there and the, the, sort of the mortality rate is astronomical. So we're, in the UK we're raising the funds to buy the vaccine and the needles and, and the fridges to keep the stuff in. To, uh, to ship out there. To ship really out there. Uh, UNICEF are, are organising the medical side and the, the Ugandan scouts are going into the villages because they're trusted. Uganda's got a history of uh, civil war and the people distrust, distrust authority. So uniform uh, people would so under normal circumstances. That's right. Be they've, they've always trusted the Scout Association in Uganda. So hopefully there'll be a lot of... So really the, 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 the helping other people aspect of, of uh, the Scout movement and the, and the Scout code is actually more appropriate than ever in many ways, isn't it? Oh, because yes. Because you're helping more people. We, 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 we try to help everybody. On a global uh, scale. On, on a global scale. I mean, we've got programs going on in Russia and all the former... Um, Eastern Bloc countries where scouting has been allowed to start up again because it was banned um, and we're trying to sort of get out there with equipment and, and skills and so the young people out there can have a you know a, a worthwhile youth. As well as that sort of serious aspect, semi-serious aspect of it, I mean the fact that they're helping fund, they're going to develop as people as well. The emphasis is very much on having fun. Tell me a bit about some of the items uh, involved there. <sighs> We have a, a training program and it's very carefully put together so there's always an element of fun into it. Uh, I mean, you, some of the photos show w rafting. Now, if you can imagine 
a gang of boys building a raft and sailing out 10 foot and the thing falling apart, then I've seen it. Right. It's fun. They enjoy it, actually. They're not um, put off by it because they, they drag it back and, and do it again. The, the fun part is the key to scouting. It's, it's, it's fun in every aspect of, of scouting that we undertake, right. even, even as adults. So, so the adults, that is, the, the volunteers who, who assist the, the young people in, in developing and in, in these skills, um, get quite a lot out of it too? They get an awful lot out of it. I get an awful lot out of it. Uh, and um, everybody who, we all do different roles in, in the movement. And uh, some of us have got specialist skills, obviously. But uh, we, we, we get a, a kick out of it by seeing the young people enjoying themselves and, and having a good time. And, uh, having something worthwhile in their lives. We should stress at this point that the, the, these people, these adults who assist all the time, are entirely voluntary. Yes. And they don't get paid. Contrary to uh, public opinion or some quarters, you know, we don't get paid. It's purely voluntary. Um, and it's not just one night. You know, it's, it could be t three or four nights a week and weekends. So. so there must be some fun in it or they wouldn't do it. That's right. Now, yes. the reason you've, uh, you've actually come today, apart from to, to tell us a little bit about scouting in the 90s, is to appeal for help uh, from people who might volunteer to, to do just what we've been suggesting? Yes, uh, in the library this, on the 19th of uh, April, we have a, a display for a week. And also in the, in the Queensmere on the 23rd, we have our road show, in which people can come along. I'll be there, and a few of my colleagues will be there. If they're interested, do come along and talk to us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is uh, a role they can fill, because we are you know, we are quite short in certain areas of help. And, right. and, and they can discuss the opportunities with can you. Discuss and the opportunities uh, and, and we can take it further. You know, I can come around, sit down and talk to them, or some of my colleagues can. We are in certain areas quite desperate for help and it does hamper our development program for Slough. What type of people are you looking for? For example, what age group? Do they need any specific qualities? Is there an upper age limit? Well, to be a warrant, a, a leader, 65. Um, is the, is the upper is, limit? Yes, yeah, the upper limit. Uh, 18 is the lower limit. Um, and should they have specific skills or, or really just be an all-round person who enjoys... They don't have to only have any specific skills. I mean, I, I think the most important one is, you know, that they like, they like kids and they want to see young kids having fun and doing something useful with their time. Um, we, we offer leader training. We have some excellent leader training facilities. So anybody who thinks, well, I can't do it because I haven't got anything to offer, and that's not the case. So they'll benefit too. Finally, yeah. if, if anyone's watching who's interested in becoming a volunteer, if they don't uh, manage to get along to the Queensmere or to the library and, and drop your line, let's say, uh, what should they do? Who should they contact? They, they can contact me on 0753 four, uh, 545 And uh, if I'm not there, my wife will take a message and I'll be back to them as soon as possible. Right. And we also have another number, which is 0628... 389, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 38982, and that's Brian Belcher. Uh, and he'd also be uh, delighted to help as well. Thanks very much for taking the time to come in, and wish you luck with your uh, exhibition. Thank you. And Thanks continued success with the Scout Movement. Time now for some therapy. Now, get a little closer to the screen. That's it. Now, rub the WMTV symbol, and you should see a house appear. Perhaps one of the most trendy forms of complementary medicine today is aromatherapy. The high streets are littered with bath oils and massage oils, but as we'll find out, these are not pure aromatherapy treatments. The real treatments are specially prepared for individual patients by people like Valerie Plummer, who's a qualified aromatherapist. So Val, I've been uh, hunting through my mum's bathroom cabinet and I've found something that says aromatherapy on it. What do you think of that? Well, these, these are fine if you want, you know, just to have a, a pleasant smelling bath. Um, it does say aromatherapy essential oils. What it doesn't say is pure essential oils. Mm -hmm. And we see in here that there's jasmine, and I, I don't suppose that you paid more than two or three pounds for this. Mm. And a bottle of jasmine oil costs around 70 pounds. Right. So it shows that obviously they're not pure essential oils, but they'll make a nice smell. Right. Um, if you want to take aromatherapy seriously and to use pure essential oils for benefit to the health, Mm. then you'd do better to look for something that actually says pure essential oils right. and use, use price as a guide also. So, Valerie, what exactly are essential oils? 
Well, an, an essential oil, it's a little bit of a misnomer because for a start it isn't an oil. If you put a couple of drops of lavender oil on some blotting paper, within a few minutes it will have disappeared. They're highly volatile. It's actually a liquid which is present in tiny droplets within a plant. We're not sure why plants have essential oils, but we think it's so that it can attract beneficial insects and to repel predators. And over the years it's been discovered that these essential oils have various therapeutic properties. Mm. And what sort of um, plants, vegetables, contain essential oils? Well, you can usually tell because something that has um, a very fragrant smell or a very flavoursome taste would tend to have an essential oil in it. And because these bottles don't actually mean anything to anyone that might be watching, what I've done is put a few bits and pieces together in a basket. These, these um, items would actually give up an essential oil right. and I thought it might be useful to talk through the properties of the, of the various oils that, that uh, these plants give up. Right. So um, for instance tangerine is a very gentle oil and that would be safe to use on someone that was pregnant for instance. It's good to use if someone has got very poor peripheral circulation. Ladies in particular tend to have freezing cold feet mm. so it's quite a good oil to use for that. Um, You'll find this one quite interesting, juniper oil. It's a bit of a paradox in that gin is made from juniper, but if you went for an aromatherapy massage the day after you'd had a night out on the town, I would tend to use juniper oil because it helps to break down the toxins in the bloodstream. Right. Um, essential oil of lemon, if someone had a verruca or warts, um, essential oil of lemon would tend to be able to deal with that over a period of weeks. Right. And what you're saying, some of those oils are probably quite potent. Absolutely. Mm. And this is a big thing. You know, you can go into most high street chemists or health food shops these days and pick up a bottle of essential oil. Mm. But in fact, um, it, it's too easy to pick these things up, really. Some of them can be extremely potent and extremely dangerous. Right. For instance, if someone went in and bought a bottle of sage oil and put it in their bath and they were an epileptic, it may have, you know, undesirable circumstances. Right. So that leads me on to your particular work as an aromatherapist. Um, what does a treatment for somebody in aromatherapy consist of? It would firstly consist of them coming along for an initial consultation. At that point, we would have a discussion about their health in the past and their current health, and in particular, why they had consulted me in the first place. Um, it would be interesting to know um, about their lifestyle, diet, exercise, smoking, drinking habits, this sort of thing, because advice can be given along those lines. Right. And then once you've actually done your, uh, your, your talk with somebody, what do you go on from there with the, the actual oils themselves? Yes, we would then decide what form the aromatherapy massage would take, whether it would be, say, a full body treatment or a back, neck and shoulders, dependent on what the condition was. Mm. So the first thing that uh, we did today was a little treatment for a back problem that I have um, involving a massage and, and the oils. What were the oils you mixed first of all? The oils that we used for you today were rosemary, which tends to open up the blood vessels within muscles to let more blood get in there. Um, some juniper, which deals with the stiffness that you may have in the back and the uric acid which builds up in the muscle fibres, and some marjoram, some French marjoram, which tends to deal with any spasm that might be in the muscles. Mm. And what about the actual massage treatment itself? How would you describe that? Well, we, we elected to do um, a back, neck and shoulder massage on you. Even though the problem was in your low to middle back, we did an entire back massage on you because, of course, the spine stretches from the base of the skull to the tailbone. And mm. It's very important to massage the whole back. Now, I'm still a little confused because we're talking about aromatherapy oils which give off fragrance. Uh, I'm not quite sure how applying it to the skin can help at all. Okay. Aromatherapy works in three ways. Firstly, the massage itself. There are lots of benefits from massage. It's very relaxing. It can help ease muscle problems. It can help ease stiff joints, etc. So that's one way that it would work in a massage setting. A second way would be that the molecules in the oils are, are very tiny and they're able to pass through the skin surface and get into the bloodstream. A lot of people think that's a very wacky idea, but in fact, in, in orthodox medicine, there are lots of things that are actually applied through the skin and uh, even anti-smoking patches these days. Mm. So it's, it's a very, sim you know, it's a, it's a concept that you can um, take on board. Right. Um, 
And of course, by something going through the skin, it actually bypasses the digestive system, where if you're taking it by mouth, it would have to go through the stomach, mix with what you had for lunch and the enzymes trying to digest it. But by going through the skin, it goes straight in there. And what about the actual aroma side, the smell side? Sure, OK, that, that's the third point. And what actually um, is thought to happen there is that the odour molecules trigger off um, sensory nerve pathways, which go to the area of the brain which deals with our emotions. Then, the area of the brain which deals with things like heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, would also be affected. But are there oils and things that we can use at home in our bath straight away? Yes, of course, there are. Um, again, I would very much like to stress the safety aspect and for someone to know what, what they were actually buying or using. Mm. And really, before anyone goes out and uses these oils at home, I would recommend they, they read a book mm. on, the, on the topic. Right. And in fact, I've got a book here which I would recommend. It's very inexpensive, um, costs £1.99, and it's got all of the safety data in it. Right. It's also got recommendations for which oils you might wish to use for for different conditions. Right. Um, so that's the first thing. Secondly, there's also a move afoot at the moment to tighten up the labelling of essential oils. And really, I would advise the general public to find oils that have got on their label instructions for use. Mm. Um, because otherwise, you know, you pick up an oil and it just says on the label what it is and maybe a couple of safety features, but not how much to use or how to use it. Right. What other ways can we have aromatherapy treatment? Well, not so much in aromatherapy treatment, but to enjoy the benefits of essential oils for, that anyone can enjoy would be to vaporise the oils around the home. Right. And that would involve something that looks a little bit like this, where you put a nightlight candle in, fill the bowl with water and put a few drops of oil, and as the candle heats the water, it would give off a steam. Right. Um, and in that way, the, um, the vapour would be propelled into the atmosphere and you'd be inhaling it, rather as you would in a bath or in a massage. Right. Um, and, you know, they can come in any shapes and sizes from the most simple to the most um, exotic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Valerie. It's absolutely fascinating. If you'd like any more information on aromatherapy treatments, essential oils, or anything else we've mentioned in this item, look out for Valerie Plummer's telephone number on The Moving Magazine at the end of the show. Thank you, Will. Uh, just before I go any further, um, this little sticker here you can probably see is for the Scouts, and uh, I'm sorry I wasn't wearing it during the Scout interview, and uh, apologies to those concerned, but thank you for it. Still to come on Scene on 7, Tony O'Rourke meets Gene Boat and music from Phantom Blue. Back in a few minutes with uh, an update and much, much more, this is Scene on 7. Welcome back, it's 30 minutes past the hour. Now then, this week's update once again returns to the horrific and spiralling crime scene. Hounslow was the venue this time for a bizarre series of crimes which were in fact linked. At approximately 9pm on Monday the 11th of April, two female teenagers aged 14 and 18 were abducted and subjected to two serious sexual assaults. Not content with threatening the girls with a knife, they were then taken to a third floor flat at Benson Close in Hounslow and the girls were then kept there and later sexually assaulted once more. One of the girls managed to free herself and raise the alarm. When police arrived, they found the distressed, as well as finding the distressed girl, they found an elderly Asian couple in the flat. They were dead. They had been repeatedly stabbed. Mr. and, Bis Mr. and Mrs. Ambaznar, both in their 80s, were a quiet couple who were obviously in no position whatsoever to defend themselves. 
Police and neighbours alike are horrified by these crimes and although they have suspects, they are appealing for witnesses who may have some further information. If you were in the area of either Cromwell Road Hounslow or Benson Close Hounslow after 9pm on Monday the 11th of April, please contact either the incident room by calling 0784 446 821 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Detective Superintendent Rowling Hemmins is in charge of the investigation. They're waiting for your call. It will be in the strictest confidence. Our thoughts are with the families of both the teenage girls and Mr. and Mrs. Ann Basner's relatives. A 23-year-old man, Milton Wheeler of Hounslow, has appeared at Felton Magistrates Court, charged with both murders and rape. Another senseless crime, and they call this a civilised society. Bubba Mitchell has been out to find out exactly how efforts are progressing on the work being done by pressure groups working on behalf of the disabled who struggle every day of their lives simply to move around our area. They call it access, and here's Bubba's report. WMTV has come to Windsor and Maidenhead's access group at York House, Windsor to find out what we can do to help people with disabilities and what the access group does. We speak first to Jill Smith, who's on the access committee and has a visual disability. Could you tell me a little bit about the sort of things that get in the way that cause the, the, your dog to guide you into the road? Um, yes, there's uh, children's bicycles. They very often leave their bicycles in the middle of the footpath. Builders' materials, when they're doing um, extensions or whatever to other people's houses, they leave all their building materials right in the middle of the footpath. Parked cars open windows. We have a lot of old buildings in the area and, and windows out, open directly out onto the footpath. Visually impaired people cannot pick up glass at all. You can't see glass. You walk straight into it. Overhanging trees, hedges, all they need is to be cut back. And for a visually impaired person walking along the footpath to suddenly have wet leaves and wet hedge slapped in your face is absolutely horrendous. And what, I mean, presumably it's a hazard, a traffic hazard, if your dog has to guide you around somebody's bicycle, somebody's yes, sand I'm, pile for their, ex their house to be extended, yes. you're actually having to go into the, into the road? I'm for, I am then forced into the road. I'm forced into the road. The dog has to take me to the curb, very often guide me through parked cars, take me out into the street, into oncoming cyclists, which I am then a hazard to them, and of course other car drivers. I'm also a hazard to them, as well as them being a, an extreme danger to me. Please. So if people could just think a little bit in advance, then you wouldn't have to Absolutely. go all around the houses just to be able to walk down the street. Yeah. The foot baths belong to the whole of the community. Ian Bedford, you're chairman of the Windsor and Maidenhead Access Group. Perhaps you could tell me a little bit about what the group achieves and what it plans to do. The access group was formed some four years ago from people from all walks of disability groups etc and the aim of the group is to make the environment in Windsor and Mainhead more accessible for the people uh, of the borough. And what have you managed to do in the last few years? The awareness is the most important thing. There are some particular items that um, people in the local area can see. Barclays Bank for example which was unaccessible for people with wheelchairs has now been made accessible, there's no steps through the door. And it's some of those things that have highlighted the Access Works group. We will be talking to some people on the committee who have um, disabilities themselves, but how did you actually get the group together and who, who actually sits and represents um, various disabilities on the committee? That was hard work, getting the group <laughs> together. It was a matter of just slogging around, talking to people that were working with these groups, trying to form what was a reasonable group with all consensus of opinions. We also take on board mothers and toddlers, not just people with disabilities. Mothers and toddlers tend to get to places that people with a wheelchair or a guide dog do not tend to get, and if we can make these places accessible for them, we will not have a problem in the future. Jim, so you're actually on the committee for the access group for Windsor and Maidenhead. You have a disability, but you're an independent mm, member correct. of the group. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the sort of things that you come in touch with every day that, could, that make your life a little bit difficult, that people could help with. 
Well, mostly, I mean, as I have a certain amount of mobility, thanks to the electric scooters that we use nowadays, um, it's things like people parking on pavement. It's the inconsiderateness of some people. Um, and it's not a deliberate uh, sort of thing by most people to make life difficult. It's just that they don't think. Um, people are leaving their wheelie bins out on the pavement in inconsiderate positions rather than putting them back against their fences or their gates, um, parking over ramped curbs, which is the only way I can dismount and mount from one side of the road to another. Um, builders' materials care, listly left about. Um, and... Uh, just sort of basic things that... Basic, get... everyday things that people just, uh, with a little more thought, mm. could make my life a lot easier and people like me. Now, there are certain things that the council could do, for example, in making um, sure that there's access to certain buildings mm. and such like. But just so people have got an idea of what it's like for you if, for example, they park on one of the ramps, um, you know, going down on the pavement, what do you actually have to do if there's a car in your way and you can't cross the road? What, do you have to wait or do you have to find another way around or do you have to go down the road? Well, it normally involves making uh, often quite a lengthy detour and then it uh, can mean travelling in the road, which is, of course, um, dangerous and um, car drivers particularly find this... Uh, that consider that I'm being inconsiderate and foolhardy. So, um, and it creates an antipathy between uh, uh, the able-bodied person and the, you know, the, the disabled. You can help some of the 4.3 million people in Great Britain who can't walk or have difficulty walking, and the 1.7 million people who have a visual impairment by doing just a few things. For example, not parking on the footpath, not allowing your dog to foul the footpath, not obstructing the footway with things such as wheelie bins, refuse sacks, overhanging shrubs, and so on. Thanks, Bubba. Actually, I'm amazed that it's still not sorted out, as I first reported on this issue some three years ago. And I must say that spending a day in a wheelchair was just about the hardest day's work I've ever been asked to do. We wish them well. The Slough Writers Cooperative are publishing a new magazine. It's called Story Seller. And Michael Piercy, and I'm delighted to say just able to join us, William Campbell, are in the studio with the details. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Thank Hello. you for coming. Uh, Michael, start with you. Tell me uh, all about the story seller. Could we have a look at it? Yeah, What's sure. it all about? That's, uh, that's the magazine. Right. It's an A4, runs to 48 pages. Um, it contains fiction and non-fiction and poetry. Um, we've put it together since November with the help of uh, Slough Borough Council. They've put up the funding for the printing and they've also funded our competition. Right. More about the competition later. Mm -hmm. um, William, are all the items in the, in the magazine written by local authors? They are all local authors. Um, they stretch out as far as Reading, uh, High Wycombe area, but we're concentrating mainly on the East Berkshire, South Bucks area for the time being. Right. All amateurs? All, yes. Semi-amateurs? Semi-amateurs, yes. Obviously they need to have, have some skills. Um, are the, is the bulk of it literature or is the bulk of it poetry? Well, the, the, the bulk of what, of what we've published uh, are short stories, literature. Right. And um, poetry is a very difficult area. As, um, we'd like to get more poetry. We had a lot, but to be honest, we, we have to sort of thin it out a little bit. Putting Some it of it got a bit heavy, did it? <laughs> well, yeah, and, and but it's a very, very difficult thing to actually um, get together enough poetry of a suitable... Well, standards and qualities are the wrong words mm. to use. Well, you've got to be objective, of course, and yeah. that's very, very difficult because it is purely subjective. It's a very mm. personal exactly. thing. And it's, it's mm. the reader will decide ultimately. Yeah, that's hard. With the, with the, with the short stories, um, the way we work is all three of us. There's um, Sarah Waddington is, a, right. uh, is our co-editor. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be with us today, unfortunately. But we, all three of us read every piece that was submitted, and we had over 200 submissions for this. Um, and we all made comments on it, and every author's received three sets of comments, which uh, we, we were happy doing that because you get at the beginning, you get this feeling that um, who are you to sort of pick to up criticize work. my work? So we yeah. felt we ought to just explain that. But, that was uh, what I was trying to say about the, it's, it. It's a very, very personal thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, William, you obviously write as well. Mm -hmm, How does yes. it feel when someone criticizes your work? Um, I've got used to it these days. <laughs> <laughs> and now you've got, you've got the teacher's hat on, and you can you can. Judge a little bit. Um, I wouldn't say I had a teacher's hat on. My grammar is not that um, hot. Um, provides a good story and says what the author, what I think the author is wanting to say. And it doesn't necessarily have to wrap itself up at the end, which a lot of stories tend to. 
It can sort of hang in the air. Yes. Do any, will any of them, this is going to come out quarterly, I believe, is that right? Yes, correct. Um, do any of the stories follow on? For example, if you had a three or four part story, could you have one in one quarter and one in the next? Well, we didn't, we voided that because it's a long time to wait for the next episode, yeah. quarter, you know, three months. But think of the tension. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I don't think I could bear it for three months. No, we, 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 we would take, we would consider um, taking a, a, a part of a novel, say, so that you can get a flavour of it. But that, so far we haven't been able. We've had a few novels submitted for consideration, but so it's not been able. We've not been able to do that yet. But we would do that. Would you say this? This either of you can answer this one. I mean, both of you in a way. Oh, could this? Uh, sorry, William. Yeah, I beg right. your pardon. That's okay. uh, could this lead to, to greater success for, for a potential, uh, let's say, a budding author or a poet, uh, to, to getting a book published, for example, if it was a sh an abridged version of what is a, a longer work? We would like to hope so. One of the areas that we. Be passing the magazine on to our publishers and I know that when um, publishers representatives have come to the writing group they've said they scan these sort of magazines looking for good writers with a view to develop them. So they, are they looking specifically at let's say a style of writing or, or, or a very good story let's say that they wanted to expand and publish into a larger volume let's say? Well I'm not really wanting to speak for a publisher no, but sure. from what I hear from what they're saying they look for the style and the quality of the writing, the story will come as a result of that. If Does it immediately hit you when one is, is dropped on your doorstep that this is a real winner? Well, it sometimes does. Sometimes we've agreed completely on a, on a piece. But um, occasionally, we, we, we're one story in there called Shaping the Skeleton, and we had a yes, a possible, and a no, and we had a real argument about that. But it's so actually... Th so therefore, it potentially actually is a, is a winning story because three of you got very diverse opinions mm -hmm. on it. That accounts for the, your readership, if you like. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and so w what are the chances for this story? This story's actually in, is it? Yes, it's actually in there. It's, uh, it's, I could describe it really as, um, I don't know, what, what did we say? I can't remember what we said it was now. It's slightly surreal, yeah. futuristic. No, the actual subject of it was, um, oh, uh, genetic engineering in a family setting, we <laughs> oh, described it as. That was it. Um, a nice little phrase. But it's, actually, it's a bit sort of a black comedy, really. But it's, it's really well written. I mean, actual, the spread of stories is, uh, I mean, we, we were quite pleased with that because there's no sort of, no theme to it. It's a, it's a big, there's a lot of variety in there. We've got sort of a short story about uh, Janet Hayward, but it's only a page. Um, she's a Slough author. And there's another one from a guy called Mick Wood. Um, and it's about a young man realising he's misspent his adolescence. Well, Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Could end up here, couldn't you? Yeah. Well, um, what would you say, therefore, that, that because of the diversity of these, that they will appeal to all age groups? I mean, there's nothing in there that, let's say, a young person couldn't, oh, couldn't no. handle. That's right. I mean, we, we, don't, uh, we haven't had to actually edit anything in that sense. For, right. for but you would if it came to it. Material. Well, well, well we, if it's a good story, um, we, we'd like to see it go in. We'd, it'd have to be have to be really offensive for us to knock it out. I mean, we wouldn't want to put it in just uh, in order to create a stir. But at the same time, occasionally, the people, if they're writing something and it's creative work, you may have to get the odd swear word or the odd situation that's a bit risque. In fact, one, one poet, poem in there by Richard Palmer from Maidenhead, um, he won the prize in the Slough Arts Festival. Uh, but the people who organised that felt they couldn't read it out at the, at the um, winning evening because there were, it was a, it's... It's called saucepan, and it's about sexy saucepans. So well, uh, we illusion, put that cross illusion there. Is it? Yeah. What's that? It's, it's a bit like really he does all the technical stuff. It's a bit like a, a record, then, William, isn't it? Like, f let's say, relax. Frankie goes to Hollywood. They weren't allowed to play it on Radio One, but mm -hmm. it was number one in the charts. That's right. Mm. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's the dilemma you face. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, now, there's something for most readers within the magazine, and the idea is that they might read some of the other stuff and find out they like that type of writing as well. Right. It's the diversity that Mike was talking about earlier on. Now, as well as being uh, published in, in your magazine, uh, which we wish you success, by the way, with the magazine, um, you're running a competition, uh, as you say, in conjunction with Slowborough Council. Tell me more about that. Well, that's the, the Fenerbrockway Peace Prize for Literature. Fenerbrockway was the MP for Slough. Uh, for an awfully long time, and he was uh, quite a big name in the peace movement. So the theme of the competition is peace. Uh, we'll accept any, any interpretation of that theme. I mean, we've got a feeling that perhaps if people take it down to a personal level, it can be, make it more interesting. We don't want sort of national strife all the time and 
the nuclear debate. But um, theme is the piece of the, is the theme of the competition. No, peace is the theme of the competition. Right, and then, right. and uh, Fenner Brockway um, has named is is name of the person who the prize is named after. Yeah, that's right. He was the MP right. for Slam. William, what are the prizes? What sort of money can they win? There's up to five hundred pounds in the purse. There, there are a couple of sections. There. there are three sections. There are one section for fiction, one for non-fiction, each with a hundred pound first prize and second and third prizes. And there is a third category for under 15s poetry, which has a top prize of fifty pounds. So a good, a good uh, diverse chance of mm -hmm. winning there. Yes, it is. Um, if a budding author or poet is one of our audience, and I'm sure there are, I mean, we know mm -hmm. from previous experience there's some very talented people out there watching the program. Um, if they're watching and they'd like to, let's say, contribute to your next issue, what should they do? Mike? Oh, oh. I talked off there. Uh, send, <laughs> <laughs> if they send us a self-addressed envelope, right. we will send them our contributor's notes. Right. And the, the, do you want me to read to say the address? Or will By that all means, yeah. Thing? We'll have the, the address up, please, if we could. Yeah, it's 26. Okay, we're going to put the, put the address on the movie magazine. Okay. I've been told, but I've got the address. I will read it out. Great. Right. Well, they just send us a stamp address envelope. We send them contributors' notes. Right. And from that, then they can submit the work they want to. There's right. no limits at all on what they submit. Excellent. Well, as I say, we wish you great success with the magazine. It looks mm -hmm. like a winner to me, and uh, I'm sure because of the local nature, it'll be a big success. Hope the so address is the Story Seller Magazine. That's 26 Sippenham Lane, Slough, SL1. 5BS. That's SL1 5BS and it's called The Story Seller. So get your entries in now for the next issue. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Regular viewers of the show may remember Little Sister. She was a popular guest way back in November. We all enjoyed her. Here's a brief reminder of Little Sister's big hit, Way of Life. Great news, Little Sister, that was her hit way of life, has a terrific deal. She signed it this week with Millennium Interactive and Message Music. That's a computer games company and a record label. She's just 13, is our Kelly, and she's been signed up to record the new music for a new computer game called Pinky. It promises to be a huge success, as does her new single, Boys Company. Our producer will be delighted to hear that. Kelly will be back with us very, very soon, and congratulations to her on that fantastic deal. One of our reporters has been to meet a very special lady this week, well loved by TV viewers and theatre goers alike, and known by millions for her genteel catchphrase, that tart! The former Nellie Boswell meets Tony O'Rourke. So what could possibly have happened to the cast of Bread since the show finished in 1991? Well, we just don't know. But what we do know is that Ma Boswell has ended up here, at the Theatre Royal in Windsor. Let's go inside and have a chat. Well, Jean Boat, welcome to Scene on 7 and WMTV. Hi, thanks for asking me on. Well, tell us, first of all, have you had any difficulty in shaking off the character of Ma Boswell, with which you've been associated? Uh, quite. And although I didn't, haven't made any programmes since about 1991, I think it was, um, it was quite a long time ago, um, it is difficult. I was just standing in my house today um, talking to my secretary, and a man just passed by with his children and recognised me, and waved through the window and brought his kids around for an autograph in my village where I live. So um, wherever I go, and even here in Windsor where I am now in this play, people stop me and say hello, which is great, because they, they liked her, obviously, thank goodness. If they hadn't liked her, well, that might have been a problem. <laughs> but anyway, um, I suppose it's, uh, immediately I went to Chichester after we'd finished recording the last series uh, and the tour. We did a tour of Bread, of course. We did the Christmas show in London of Bread with David Pugh, and um, uh, so it went on for a long time. And then, of course, we went on to uh, cable with, with the series. The whole of the series has been shown for the last th three years, mm -hmm. as, right to its last episode. So it hasn't left me alone at all. But I have played different roles on stage. I did have a very, very busy career before I hit television. 
the first 10 years of my life was all in the theatre, and that's why, that's why it's so exciting to be at Windsor. It just reminds me of those days when I was beginning my career in theatres that did exist like this one, where they actually build the sets in the dock, and they make the costumes upstairs. And in fact, on the day of the production here, they actually got together and made me two costumes, just like that, <laughs> because my, the ones that had come from the costumers weren't right. And they just set to and made them. And those sort of theatres, I think there's not a handful left in the country like Windsor, which is quite remarkable. And there isn't one that actually runs as a commercial organization. Although I do say, we're looking for sponsors. Um, we do the bar doing downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But do you miss Fred? Do you miss the cast? And uh, I the... see them all the time. We were talking just now about Graham Bickley was here in this theatre doing a concert a week last Sunday. He went straight back into musicals from whence he came. And what was so marvellous about Graham when we replaced our first Joey, Peter Howitt, um, he'd never heard of Bread at all. But, and Graham, and he was very famous for his performances in West End musicals, has a wonderful singing voice. So he tr popped along to the audition because he'd just finished in a musical, you see, and he didn't know what he was letting himself in for, did he? So when they said, yes, will you play Joey, he really didn't understand what that meant to the public of England, taking over the number one pin-up boy of the time, you might say, which Joey character was. Uh, and it's really, I mean, knocked him backwards, I think, when he realized what a responsibility, how awful that was for him. He was terribly brave, and he uh, got away with it, and uh, we went on for another three years with him, which was great, and he was wonderful. But I do keep in touch with them all, um, with Kenneth, Grandad, and, and uh, Victor McGuire's just done a play, and Jonathan Morris, and, and Melanie Hill. I mean, I, I, I keep in touch with everybody. In fact, I was just talking to them this morning. So. Mm -hmm. And what about Brighton Bells? What's happened to that? We did ten, and I think they showed five or six. And, of course, in com it was the very first comedy that commercial television had embarked upon, the first light entertainment comedy, sitcom. And they were expecting viewing figures of, in the region of 12 million or something, which we had got for the pilot. So when we only came in at seven and eight, they thought, this isn't going to work. However, so they took us off and said, we'll show them next year in a different slot. Well, obviously, it's the wrong time, so we haven't heard any more about that. But I think they've learned now that it's not so easy to get 12. I don't know of any BBC comedies that get 12. Seven to eight is Seven quite respectable. Seven to eight is very respectable. And so I was a bit put out about that. I think they, pa I felt they panicked a bit and that they should have given it another little run to see if it indeed caught on. We thought it was rather super, but you can't tell. You don't know what they like, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Have you any other television jobs lined up? Well, um, it's very difficult to pick another cherry. And I thought that was a bit lucky to find another comedy series like Brighton Bell so soon after Bread. And I think you have to wait and just take anything on that comes along. I mean, I'm, I'm writing one or involved with devising one with Alexandra Bastida. Um, an idea that we've evolved, which we hope will come to fruition. Um, and you want to sort of take things in hand a bit and start thinking up ideas. They're desperate for new comedy, I think. Um, it's, a, it's the most difficult part of programming to find something that works, something that catches the public's imagination. So you've just got to keep trying. Well, writers keep finding that themselves. Most famous writers sort of put, write new shows, they don't work. And I've worked it out, I think about one in four is a smash hit for, for a well-known comedy writer, perhaps one in three at the most, and they usually have two or three series which are not quite as, don't quite catch on mm -hmm. to the public's imagination. So there's always going to be the old turkey. There's the odd turkey, and so <laughs> I'm, I'm having a go at trying to write, well not the turkey, but it probably will be, but we'll have a go, we'll have a go. I'm sure it'll be a great success. <laughs> T tell us briefly about Arsenic and Old Lace. Which well, Arsenic and Old Lace, I suppose it's the most famous comedy ever written, but people forget about it forget what the story is until they start sitting in the seats, I think, and then you hear the murmurs, oh, yes, oh, yes, that's right. Because it's about two sweet old ladies who really feel their mission in life is to relieve old men from the misery of their existence. And uh, so when anyone comes along and says they're very lonely, they offer them some elderberry wine and then, you know, let them gently go to sleep. And so then their brother, Teddy, um, he sort of helps them to bury the bodies very gracefully with the full service of their religion. And, of course, eventually 
it catches up with them and they all end up in a mental home. <laughs> <laughs> and I, this, man, this man who wrote it, Joseph Kesselring, he wrote many, many plays from the turn of the century. And this is the only one um, which he wrote in 1940, I think, in, in America, that caught on. And he has not had a success since, but it's earned him and his estate anyway, millions. It's funny that, isn't it, how a writer has one play that works and you'd think you'd be able to repeat it. But that does remind me of television series. If you could have a perfect formula, if you knew exactly what the answer was, well, there wouldn't be a turkey on television, would there? That's right. <laughs> but this is, it is a wonderful play. And we're, we're surrounded with wonderful actors. My co-partner in crime is Josephine Tewson, who's just been playing Mrs. Bucket's neighbor on uh, <laughs> BBC, and is a wonderful, wonderful actress. And it's been a great thrill to me. She's a terrific disciplinarian and keeps me on my toes. Stephen Pacey, I started as a child actor um, uh, and is well known for just, a, I mean, he's got the largest credits of all of us, I think, and he's, he's absolutely marvelous. He reminds me terribly of James Stewart. And then we have a wonderful bloke playing Teddy Gorroli, and he's absolutely brilliant. I mean, it is a very, very, very strong cast, and, and the audiences are loving it. Family show? It is a family. I've seen little kids out there because it's so ridiculous. You can't believe it's possible. Um, so that they laugh too. Uh, and it's been packed out so that it's a marvelous theatre, this. It's so original. But they have a very, very clear idea of the things they like and, and um, like to see. It's a good fun, a good laugh. Um, they come here to be entertained and they make everyone feel so comfortable. It must be the the nicest theatre in the country, <laughs> the sweetest staff, and the loveliest tea shop, and the nicest cakes. And what more do you want? I'll stay here forever. <laughs> you're definitely in the good I'm books. Definitely, with them now. <laughs> I'm definitely in their good books. I want to stay here forever. <laughs> well, Jean Boat, thank you very much indeed. You're here until the 30th of April. 30th, yes. We'll yeah. all come and see you in our droves. Oh, please, yes, please. We need the money for the uh, new bar downstairs. <laughs> so I'd leave. <laughs> thank you. So that's what happened to Mar Boswell. If you fancy a good old-fashioned evening out, then why not make it Arsting and Old Lace at the Theatre Royal in winter? Thank you, Tony, and I'm sure uh, Jean Boat enjoyed meeting him as much as he enjoyed meeting her. Jean Boat, a lovely lady and a fine actress. Time now to meet another one of the presenters at WMTV, and it's a particular pleasure to welcome Sarah Stewart to the studio. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Steve. Good to meet you. At long last, we managed to get you in here. Now then, yep. you've just joined uh, as a presenter. Not all that recently, but um, your first piece on virtual reality on last week's program. What basically prompted you to join us here? Well, I think the thing about WMTV that's so great is rather than just sort of being an airhead and sort of reading out a script, looking at it's good here. But like you're me. Yes, <laughs> kind of like you, Steve. <laughs> oh, no, but you that. get to write your own things, you know, and research your own stuff and do a bit of production and all this and that. So it's the full package, which is really a plus. I'm glad you said that and thank you for that. You got my name right that time too. Um, as well as your activities um, on screen here at WMTV, mm -hmm. you're an accomplished designer of uh, um, furniture and a painter and loads and loads of strings to your bow. Now tell me a little bit, how, how, you, how did you get into that? Well, um, I was studying um, acting and painting at university and I sort of never really thought that, you know, I would go into to painting or, you know, or try to become an artist, basically, because I thought there'd be no bucks, which I suppose there aren't. But, um, no, and I just sort of started doing it for fun when I graduated from university, and um, it sort of took off, and so I had like good a, luck. A, it was like a creative package, really, the yeah. acting and, the, and this sort of thing. Yeah. Now, we've got some pictures of some of your work um, coming up. Um, piece, if you could talk us through this, it's got your name written underneath it, and it's not a very good shot, <laughs> but it's... It, it, it sort of typifies some of the work that you do. Very, very colourful. Tell us about this one. Well, basically, they're three D um, paper constructions yep. on, in box frames, sort of up on wooden pegs. It's hard to tell, but with sort of swirly paper and little mini canvases and things stuck on. I don't know. I suppose it sort of looks a bit like a pinball machine, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a very abstract pinball machine. Now, is it yeah. a is it um, 